found, found cricket really, especially during the beginning, I found I internalised everything and and I kind of got into my own head about it and there was a lot of blame and a lot of perfectionism and all those kind of words. But um, yeah, we, I'm definitely getting there. I'm definitely getting better and taking the pressure off a little bit. Cause it's, I mean, I know it's, it's difficult, isn't it? It's like, it used to be a hobby and it used to be something we used to do because we loved it and now it's our job. <laughs> um, but I still love it. Like I still love the game of cricket. I think that's what you've, what you've got to remember. Um, I could do any job, but I could, I could quit tomorrow and do any job. Um, but I want to play cricket. Despite being just 29 years old, Fee Morris has already learned a lot about herself throughout her cricketing career. From making her county championship debut aged 14 to becoming one of the country's first professional athletes outside the decentralised England setup, to top scoring for her team in the first ever Women's 100 final and much more, there have been plenty of moments for Fee to celebrate so far. But it has been a far from easy ride for the all-rounder. An incident in her early 20s led to a severe decline in Fee's mental health and well-being, which she struggled to admit and accept, and ultimately led to her taking a two-year break from the sport and, as she says in her own words, going off the rails a bit. And while advances in the women's game have seen the introduction of regionalised professional contracts, Fee also said that she initially struggled to cope with the pressure she placed on herself as one of the first athletes to be offered one of these deals. Because all of this has taught Fee a key lesson that we can all learn from, and that is to embrace what you love. Having recently moved to Northwest Thunder to play alongside former sports field guests Kate Cross and Alex Hartley, Fee reveals how she's had a new lease of life and cannot wait for the season to begin in the coming months. This has further been aided by the continual help and support she receives from the PCA and the Professional Cricketers Trust with her mental health. In a wide-ranging and wonderfully honest interview, Fee also speaks about how the women's game can continue to grow in the coming years, her new business adventure that combines her passion for cricket and helping to rehabilitate injured athletes, and also how she became a mentor with our wonderful partners at the Mintridge Foundation. Welcome back listeners to another episode of Sportsville, and I'm delighted to say that we are joined by our fifth professional cricketer on the show, our third women's cricketer. And unlike the last two, I'm hoping this one doesn't call me a psychopath, but we'll uh, we'll see how it goes. So I'm delighted to welcome Fee Morris to the show. So Fee, lovely to meet you. And uh, we're at the end of uh, another, I say bizarre year, not quite as strange as 2020 and 2021, but a lot's happened this year. How do you reflect on your 2022? How's it gone from your perspective? Um, I'd say it's been... A year of growth I reckon that's the, that's the word I'd use to describe it it's been a lot of learnings this year it's not, not been the easiest but um the last couple of months have been to to the best I've had in a long time um like I've moved up to Manchester yeah about two months ago and I'm absolutely loving it um yeah it was a little bit of a difficult summer for me uh cricket wise and and just life wise but yeah it seems to have worked out right in the end so I'm hoping we can Carry, carry that on for the next like, 15, 16 days until 2023. You mentioned there you've moved up to Manchester, you've joined the Thunder, you've been in training with them. How are you finding it? How are you settling in? Oh, I'm absolutely loving it. Um, yeah, it's been, it was a really difficult decision as to whether or not I've even carried on playing cricket because um, it's quite a big move for me coming up north. But yeah, I've, I've absolutely loved it. Like The girls are brilliant. It's such a good group. Um, it's probably the most together group I've been a bit a part of. Um, the coaches have been great to work with. It's it's an unbelievably professional setup. Um, the amount of money that Lancashire have put into women's cricket over the last couple of years is really starting to pay off. And yeah, it's been it's kind of reinvigorated my love for the game, which is exactly what I wanted and probably more than I expected. So yeah, I'm, it sounds really cliche, but I'm actually loving every minute of it. Um, so far anyway yeah and how is that transition as a professional athlete joining a new club settling with a a new group of people is that always quite tricky or is it sort of the more you you do it the more you get used to it yeah I think yeah probably the more you do it you get used to it I guess and I've I have moved around quite a lot anyway just um just from from teams that I've played for before and living in different cities and that kind of thing so 
I guess you just get to know people on the circuit and then every time you do move you kind of already know a couple of people just from playing against them and with them but um yeah this has been probably my my easiest transition um I just straight away felt felt really at home here um so I thought yeah I feel really lucky for that but also it's probably probably has been a bit easier because I've done it a couple of times before as well. Women's cricket is undergoing quite a big change at the moment, a big development. Um, a lot of things are happening. You yourself have now spent is it two years as a professional cricketer. Um, how have you found that, being able to do what you love full-time almost? Yes, yeah, this has been going into my third year. Um, yeah, I'd, being really honest, I've actually found it really difficult. Um, I think... Being completely honest, the team I was at before probably wasn't the right place for me to be, um, and it was a it was a really difficult transition. I think you know I had I had a full time career before I started being being a pro cricketer as a sports therapist, and I loved it, and I was I was good at it, and I was really building a good um, good client base and building my business there. And I thought it was going to be a bit different to what it was, kind of transitioning into being a pro. Um, and for like, a few reasons that just didn't really, really work out for me down in Bristol and that's absolutely fine but it seems to be yeah the last couple of months is is a lot more what I thought it was going to be and I just feel a lot more settled here so um it's been hard work like the work is pretty hard at the, <laughs> there's a, a lot of fitness there um my body's been pretty sore but uh, yeah I'm, I'm really really enjoying it now um so yeah just hoping I can take that into the season really so that's where that's where it actually matters <laughs> It's interesting you say that because from the outside and from what we hear, people are so enthused that we've got professional cricketers outside of the England set up in the domestic game. But from what you're saying there, maybe it isn't that becoming a professional cricketer isn't isn't that easy as or you know glamorous as it might seem. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I think I think some people probably have taken to it like a duck to water. Um, I think because you know, I, I am I'm a little bit older than, <laughs> than a few of the girls playing. Um, I actually think the girls that had careers before before being a pro, so a few of the slightly older girls, I've probably found it a little bit more difficult. Um, yeah, just because we're used to that kind of nine to five job and it being a bit more stable, and and you're not used to the up and down emotions of professional sport, and that's that's what we haven't been used to. Whereas the girls, just the the twenty year olds, the eighteen year olds that are going straight into being a pro, that's that's all they'd know. Um, so yeah, I would say from, from my experience of it, it's the, the older girls that have probably struggled a little bit more. Um, but yeah, like I said, I, I just wasn't in, in the right environment for me. It just didn't didn't fit with me. Um, and hopefully I am now. Um, so hopefully I can kind of push forward a little bit more. And that's not to say I didn't enjoy it before, but I probably struggled a little bit more than, than I would have wanted to. Alongside the professional contracts, there's also been two new or reformatted tournaments introduced in the Rachel Hayho Flint Trophy and the Charlotte Edwards Cup. You've had the 100, you've got county tournaments as well. It seems like there's a lot of cricket going on. Is, is it more than what you were used to before or is it more of a case of we're more aware of it as consumers and followers? Yeah, pro probably a bit of a mixture. Like, um, There's obviously a lot more talk about it now and I think the 100's been really important for that like playing you know playing alongside men playing the double headers with the men has been great but actually I think it's 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 a brilliant tournament in its own right the women's tournament um and it's been a lot of surprise to, to a lot of people that have gone ah oh, they're actually pretty good and you're going yeah we're actually <laughs> we're all right at cricket you know um so yeah I think it's just a bit of a mixture and like I still think in the last couple of years we haven't played enough cricket I didn't play very much cricket at all last summer and the fixtures there's a lot more fixtures this year which is it's the right thing to do and it's it's much better for us as players I'd much rather play than chain so um so yeah hopefully we can just keep pushing it forward really. and you mentioned the 100 there what's it like to have been a part of the 100 over the last couple of seasons how have you found it yeah it's um it's pretty surreal to be honest um I'm walking in, so I played for Southern Brave in the first year and um, we got through to the final and I think it was 17,000 people or something there. Um, and it was, pretty, it was pretty mad walking out to the middle and being like, oh, right, okay, they're all here to watch me, they're all here to watch us. And um, 
yeah, just the, the whole aura around it. It's just, um, it's just really exciting. It's so much fun. I think that's what I just say to people. It's so much fun. It's like, um, it, then that's what it's meant to be. You know, the hundreds, it's not meant to be this really serious, like ashes kind of vibe tournament. It's meant to be like a, a festival kind of thing and, and, and a lot of fun and all of us playing it, we just have the best time. And, and yeah, I think the cricket, speaks for itself but like if, you, if you're having a good time you generally play a bit better so I think the standard's been pretty unbelievable um it's been tough bowling against some of the best players in the world definitely um but yeah it's been big learning curve loads of fun um and just yeah great thing to be a part of really and what's it like for yourself as a player who earlier on in your career were playing and the county game was getting no coverage and the women's game was getting little coverage, not playing at big stadiums, to then going from that to almost overnight, playing in front of tens of thousands and playing in these big stadiums, TV coverage. How have you found that? Yeah, I think um that was a that was quite a big issue a few years ago when we used to when it used to be the the Kia Super League. Um because we go from playing at pretty much club grounds or club second team pitches sometimes, but then playing at, I don't know, Hove or, or Bristol or wherever, or the Oval and being on telly. And you're like, this is, it's too big of a jump. It's too big of a gap. Like the nerves were just crazy because we weren't used to it. Um, whereas we're starting to get a bit more used to it now. And uh, I think this year we've got five, for Thunder, we've got five games at Old Trafford. Um, and just even being in and around there and training there and, just knowing what it feels like to walk into a like a test stadium. Um, even just going through the gates, like a few years ago, I would have been nervous just going through the gates. Um, and now I go through the gates pretty much every day. So yeah, it's just trying to close that gap between the top and and kind of here. Um, and we're definitely getting there. I think every year it gets better. Um, I just wish we'd stop saying, oh, it's getting better and just be like, no, we're there. But I'm sure, I'm sure we will be there one day. How exciting is it to be a female cricketer at the moment with all this change going on and as you say hopefully in a few years time we won't be talking about this it will just be the norm but sort of having from from where you started out compared to where it is now so yeah how do you how do you find that yeah so um, it's absolutely crazy really to think about it like I remember when I used to play down in Hampshire so I used to play Hampshire County and then um, we won the county champs a few years ago uh probably it's probably about six years ago now and then um, I remember we were all sat around like celebrating with a bottle of beer or something like that. And then and then our manager came around and asked us for our match fees. I was like, I cannot believe <laughs> that we've just won the county champs and I'm having to give a tenner for match fees. And then five years later we're playing yeah, I'm a professional cricketer and going in and being paid to train every day. Um I like, it's absolutely crazy the the amount it's in, improved and you can see how much the standards improve. Like it, it's just living proof that if you invest, you get you get a hell of a lot back. And I think investment into women's sport in general, not just women's cricket at the moment, is anyone would be sensible to do it because you you get so much back from it. Um, and you see, like you look at the standard of the hundred, just even in the last two years, the difference between the two years is massive. And um, so it's just going to keep keep climbing and climbing. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty proud to be a part of it. Actually, it's pretty cool to be a part of it. Um, but yeah, hopefully this is just the beginning, really. And as as you mentioned before, you were part of the first ever hundred finals day. Obviously, didn't quite go your way on the on the day. It's <laughs> like you actually were top you were top scorer for the break <laughs> yeah. on that day. But yeah. how do you reflect on that game and and that experience? Yeah, still yeah, um, it still hurts it's bad, actually. I was still, was still pretty good in. Um, but I think just as a day, it was. Yeah, like nothing I'd ever experienced before. Um, the excitement around it. I don't think I was even nervous because there was no time to be nervous. And yeah, I probably was when I was walking out to bat, but I can't even remember it. it was, it's, all, it's all a big blur. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously, guessing we didn't get over the line, but I think to even have just been there for the first first ever final, to play at Lords in the final, that, that's not something I ever thought I would do. Um so yeah, it's again, it's like a, it's a really proud, proud moment for me, and something I won't ever forget. Um, my mum and dad were actually there. My mum didn't watch any of it; she was way too nervous. But um, yeah, to have my mum and dad there as well is always it's always very nice, isn't it? Playing in front of those big crowds and that, um, 
increased viewership of um, <clears throat> awareness of the women's game have you found that you've got a lot of a lot more people recognizing you and wanting to actually speak to to you after games and get your autograph and if so sort of how do you how do you find that yeah um yeah after games like it's it's pretty cool just seeing all the kids and it's actually probably not even always kids anymore it always used to be that i wait for the kids to say <laughs> to because they want you to sign their hat or whatever and it's not just kids now but um yeah it still takes a bit of getting used to i think um but I think in the hundred, I'm probably the last signature that they want. They all want like, Danny White and Tammy Bow want, and then I'm kind of the one. That, oh yeah, we'll have those as well. But um, yeah, it's definitely still pretty surreal, and it's always really funny. Like when if any of my friends from school or uni or work or whatever come and watch, and they all just find it hilarious watching me <laughs> signing autographs. They're like, "You, you're signing autographs." But um, yeah, it's cool. It just again, it just shows how much the game's growing, um, and how much more interest there is out there, and. You forget you do you do really forget how much people love it and yeah how much I guess like young kids do look up to you um and it's yeah it is it's it's good to see but you do definitely forget how how like what you are actually a part of sometimes so it's good it's definitely nice to have that to to kind of remind you and how important is it not just having games at a good time for people to watch or go and attend them and playing in the proper stadiums but also just the increased coverage around other tournaments as well so for example I've noticed in the last couple of years a lot more live streams of women's games and a lot more tv coverage and even just going on the BBC Sport or ESPN Crick Info websites and being able to see your scorecards from the Hayho Flint Trophy or the Charlotte Edwards Cup how important is that 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 actually becomes the norm and we just get to know names like yours and your ex-teammates and your current teammates even those that aren't playing for England yeah, definitely. I think um, I think it's really important that we don't just see women's cricket as the hundred, because that's kind of the pinnacle, and that's where we get all the overseas players. But actually, all the hard work gets put in over the winter and and by our regions, and and that's where we play most of our cricket. Um, so I think that you know our regional cricket is is more important than the hundred. It doesn't get as much attention, um, but it's what it's a lot more important for us. Um, and yeah, I think you know the coverage is getting better. It's still it's got a long way to go. Um, you know, I was I don't know if you saw the, the England v West Indies um there at the moment in the streams. B BT Sport Five yeah. with a very, very questionable <laughs> yeah. stream. Yeah, so it's that you know, things like that is it's really disappointing actually. And um it felt like a bit of a backward step. But I think in general it is it is getting better, but there's still a, a really long way to go. And I think our regional cricket, you know, it still it still needs a lot more attention than it does have. Um, but yeah, again, it's it's better than it was a few years ago. So, <laughs> so an upwards curve, as we keep saying. <laughs> yeah. What other changes would you would you like to see in in women's cricket? Either the way it's run or the way it's covered. Sort of what are the the things that you think going forward are the next steps to take? Yeah. So I think they're they're introducing more contracts into the teams um, in February, March, so I think, which will bring it up to I think it's eleven full time pros in each team, maybe ten. Um, but I think just increasing them year on year. Um, you know, when we first started out as pro, I think it was just five of us that were full time. Um, so the rest of the girls were just having to kind of come come to training in and around work and school commitments and that kind of thing. So I think just the most important thing is it, investing in players and investing in facilities. Um, so each region having their own base and and having a squad of full time professional players. That's that's the kind of that's where we want to get to, and I'm sure we will. Sportspiel is proud to be partners with the Mintridge Foundation, founded in 2015 by Managing Director Alex Wallace. The charity is dedicated to enhancing life skills in young people through sport. They provide a support network for young people by harnessing the power of sporting role models and have several wonderful ambassadors, many of whom have been guests on this show. The Mintridge Foundation assists young people of all ages, abilities and physical capabilities to develop confidence and resilience and create awareness of the importance of mental and physical well-being through sport. Another wonderful example of just how powerful sport can be to everyone. To find out more go to mintridgefoundation.org.uk or you can find a link in the episode show notes. You mentioned there 
that when you first joined, there were sort of five pros in the squad and other people that were not pros. How do you how do you find that? And how does does that affect like the dynamic in the team that some of you are there fully professional and there are others that are, yeah, like you say, still doing other jobs or even at school? Yeah, I think I think some of it depends on which region you're in. Um, you know, be, being here at Thunder, I, you'd come into training, you'd have no idea who was full time and who wasn't. Um, they actually, the girls here actually get paid to train in the winter, which is brilliant, and that shows how how much Lancashire are investing into us, which is it's really good to see. Um, and that means we get a lot more girls at training. Um, but I think a lot of the regions don't they don't have that, and they only have their their pros training or they have separate training sessions, and the numbers aren't as high. Um, so yeah, I guess it depends which region you're in, um, but I think that's why I'm probably enjoying Thunder so much is because it, it it feels like a whole squad and it feels like everyone gets treated the same whether you're full time or whether you're whether you're not full time pro. Um, so yeah, that's that's the way it's going and that's the way it should be going. Doing my research and, and reading around this, I remember seeing something where you mentioned about the pressure of being a a pro cricketer and how that's quite a bit different I know it's something we touched on previously but I was yeah, wondering if you could sort of explain a bit more about that and sort of yeah how you feel that sort of pressure shows itself or how, how it comes about yeah I think I think a lot of it depends on who you are as a person and, and what your experiences are um for me I put because I, I wasn't the best behaved person when I was younger especially with things cricket um I went through a real phase, especially when first turning pro, of putting so much pressure on myself to almost make up for lost time and go, okay, well, you didn't, you didn't train, you didn't do anything when you were 19, 20, 21, up to about 24. So you've now got to train 100 miles an hour all the time to make up for that lost time. And if you're not, then you, you're, yeah, you're, you're being rubbish. You need to do a bit more. Um, and then if I wasn't performing, I'd then go, well, it's because you didn't train when you were 20 because you didn't take it seriously when you were 22 and it just went it was this kind of circle went round in circles in my head um and if you have a you know my, my job before though it was pressure in a different way you know I, I was there to help people and it was a different sort of pressure but it was it wasn't so internal um I found, found cricket really especially during the beginning I found I internalized everything and and I kind of got into my own head about it and there was a lot of blame and a lot of perfectionism and all those kind of words but um yeah I'm definitely getting there yeah definitely getting better taking the pressure off a little bit because it's I mean I know it's it's difficult isn't it it's like it used to be a hobby and it used to be something we used to do because we loved it and now it's our job <laughs> um but I still love it like I still love the game of cricket I think that's what you what you've got to remember um I could do any job but I could I could quit tomorrow and do any job um, but I want to play cricket um, and that's I've just got to keep reminding myself of that sometimes. And cricket's a sport that you've been playing at a high level since you were very young. Was it 14 when you made your county first 11 debut? Yeah, that sounds about right, actually. <laughs> about 14. I was tiny as well. I didn't grow till I was about 17. So I must have, honestly, I must have looked ridiculous on that cricket pitch. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was pretty young when I won a first play. And how did you get into the sport in the first place what what was it that drew you to cricket uh really classic really boring dad brother used to play so my brother used to play in at Gloucestershire so he was I, I think he was semi-pro at Gloucester um just sat playing in the garden and then just got into it through that way really um my mum was the one that pushed me to go and play actually um but yeah just dad brother family same world <laughs> Um, what was it like being a girl playing cricket at that age or did you not really think about it really you just wanted to, to play the game um, I think when I was really young I didn't didn't really think about it I'm from quite a big family so I'm the youngest of seven and um, all three of my sisters are like really strong independent <laughs> strong independent women that are just like I don't care about you know I don't care about um, what gender I am or whatever um, so I never really went into it going, oh, I'm not sure about being a girl in a boys' sport. I've got three brothers and I'm better than them. So I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, didn't really care too much about that. But um, yeah, I think the older I got actually was probably where it became more difficult for me. Like when, I was, when I was really young, I didn't care. And then as soon as I got into being like 15, 16, I was all of a sudden going, oh, 
I don't want to be the only girl anymore. This is so, this is annoying. This is frustrating. And yeah, I kind of just started going, I don't, I don't want my whole life to be around cricket. Um, and I don't just want to be surrounded by boys all the time playing cricket. I want to have my own life outside of it. Um, so yeah, for some people, they probably struggle when they were a bit younger. But for me, it was actually when I started to get a bit older that I was going, oh, I want to be more of a part of a girls team and get away from just playing bloody boys all the time. <laughs> Do you find it because I've spoken to some athletes before that they actually like it when families or you know people they've grown up with or people they live with don't do their sport so actually there almost isn't that you there's a chance to get away from the sport in your case cricket is that something that you found with with your families that actually it's nice to just go back and be fee the person and just chat about anything else that isn't cricket yeah 100 percent. I can I think I think I I don't know if it's because I'm from a big family and mum and dad don't have the time to do it, but I, they didn't really ever put any pressure on me. Um, you know, I had, a, I had a couple of years out from playing when I was 21, 22, maybe, and there was never any pressure. There was never any making me feel bad for taking time out. Even now, like, or even when I was younger, if I didn't do very well, they were like, ah, it was fine, move on. And I feel, feel really lucky for that. And, I think some of that is probably because I come from such, such a big family and they go, well, we can't put pressure on everyone. So we might as well just not put pressure on anyone. Um, but yeah, it's a lot. Like I can, like my sister, they all know cricket and they know the rules and they know what's going on, but they don't ever really ask me about it or talk about it. And uh, yeah, that's really important, especially for for someone like me. I, I really need that, that switch off time. And it's great that I can get that from my family as well. You mentioned that your parents are not putting pressure on you. Even though they weren't doing that, you were still performing at a high level at a very young age, as we mentioned before, sort of making your county debut at, at 14 and performing really well in those those early years. But what was it like being, you know, a school a school kid playing alongside a lot older people? How did you find that? Yeah, um, yeah, it probably made me grow up a lot quicker, actually. I've, I've never really thought about it in that way. But, yeah, it probably did make me grow up a lot quicker. Um, you just used to be around older people. And I guess I quite enjoyed it because, again, like I'm, I'm the youngest of seven, so I've got six older brothers and sisters. And I was always used to be around older people. But actually, probably in, in cricket as well, I was. Um, yeah, and I think that's probably helped me now, I guess. I think at the time, maybe not so much. It was... You know, I felt, always felt like I was the baby and the, and the little one. And, yeah, I was always kind of following other people and seeing what they were doing. Um, and I think at the time that maybe uh, probably dented my confidence a little bit. But now it's, it's probably in the long run, I don't know, 10, 12 years later, it's actually finally starting to work out. But it's been it's been great to be to know a lot of range of ages and, and a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds. I've got that through cricket. Do you remember a specific moment or was even was there a specific moment where you it sort of dawned on you that you know I'm I'm quite good at this or was it just you were just playing it because you you enjoyed it and weren't really thinking about that? Um I'm not sure. I don't even think it's hit me yet. <laughs> I'm still waiting for that, <laughs> that moment. Um now I think when I was younger, I was part of the um I got picked in the England Academy when I was 16, 17, I think. So I was quite young. Um, I think like a lot of people who went through that stage of being like, oh, oh look at me. I'm, <laughs> I'm the big <laughs> I'm from the now. And um, yeah, just it was actually probably came from a real place of insecurity where I went, oh, I really don't feel good enough to be here. So I'm just going to act like I am instead. Um, I think that happens with so many people. Um, and then you kind of get, you know, I got dropped from the academy when I was 18 and kind of yeah, everything <laughs> kind of came crashing back down to earth. But it was actually probably a good thing in, in the long run. Just, um, yeah, I think I was too young to be a part of that. I know that. Um, and I didn't respond very well to it. And it didn't didn't work out. But actually, probably now, um, it's taught me a lot. Um, and yeah, still, I would never take it for granted and never go, oh, I'm, I know I'm going to be a professional cricketer for the next five years because you never really know what's going to happen, especially after, you know, obviously moving up here. So I think it's really important to never just think, oh, I've made it. 
oh yeah, I'm good enough. It's, you know, you've always got to think, ah, well, there's, there's really good players underneath me as well. So I've just got to keep getting better. And you mentioned earlier on in the interview about, and I think trying to not misquote you, but you said that your behaviour sort of around cricket, you weren't necessarily the best of. So I'm just wondering if you'd had like a chance to think back on that and maybe think about why that was the case. Yeah, I think, you know, I, like I just said, I think I was just really way too young. Um, I was probably quite an immature 16, 17 year old. Um, and that really showed when I got when I got selected for England Academy. Um, and I think like it like it happens to to a few people, you just then I then went, Oh well I'm I'm probably gonna play for England then. So actually that's fine. Like I I've made it now, I'm fine. Um and that obviously didn't didn't work out. And the girls that were working hard, they pushed on and I didn't. Um and I think a, a lot of yeah, a lot of that definitely came from, from an insecurity. Um and probably knowing in my heart that, or thinking in my heart that I wasn't good enough to be there. So instead I went, oh, well, I'm just going to act like I don't care then. Um, I'm going to kind of throw my toys out of pram and, and not train. And then if I don't train and I don't make it, then I haven't really lost anything. And I can go, well, I don't really care anyway. Um, so yeah, that was, that being really honest, that's that's probably where it came from. Um, I like to think I'm not like that at all now, which um, I shouldn't be, being 28. <laughs> And was there a, a similar question to what I asked previously? Was there a moment when you sort of recognised that and um, actively wanted to make a change, or has that sort of been a more of a, a gradual process over the years? It's de definitely been a gradual process. I think there is still there probably has even been times um, in the last couple of years where I've gone, oh, don't care anyway, don't even want to do this anyway, and it's it's a lot more fleeting now. It's not like a permanent thing that I actually think now, but. Yeah, it's just been a gradual process. And I think as my my confidence in myself has increased, um, the amount I train and the, hard, the how hard I work has increased with that. And that's because I'm not afraid to fail anymore or I'm not as afraid to fail anymore, still getting there. But, um, you know, I, d I don't think anymore, oh, well, if I, I don't, if I try and then I fail, then I've lost everything. Um, whereas, like, yeah, that's, that's what used to go through my mind. Whereas now I go, oh, well, if I try and I fail, at least I can say I've tried. And um, so yeah, it's just but it's been a really gradual, gradual process and something that I think everyone still works on and everyone struggles with a bit sometimes. Um but yeah, we're getting there. You mentioned there uh, being afraid to fail, and that's just sort of jogged my memory. Um listening to a Tail Enders podcast a few weeks ago that they made a comment on it that cricket uh, cricket is essentially a sport that sets you up to fail more than it does for you to succeed. Um so how do you sort of yeah deal deal with that because especially as a especially as a batter you're more likely to to fail than you are to succeed but how do you mentally sort of deal with that as a player yeah that's a million dollar question <laughs> um yeah I think yeah cricket's like a toxic relationship isn't it? you have one good innings and about five and then you keep coming back <laughs> um, yeah I think I'm really lucky like I'm a bowler as well so I'm actually really lucky in the sense that if I do do fail batting wise I can hopefully bowl well but um I think the most important thing is training to fail as well um so actually T Tara one of the girls that plays at um Thunder as well so something really cool the week where she said every every training session I go into I want to fail at something um I thought that was a really good way of looking at it just going right I'm gonna put 100% into the session um I'm gonna really push myself and if I fail at something that's brilliant that's perfect so that means I've really pushed myself um, and if my ceiling's here and I've pushed it here, then next week I can keep pushing it. Um, and I, yeah, I think, thought that was a really great way of looking at it. And I think put, really pushing yourself and training and doing things outside of your comfort zone gets you, gets you used to it. And then in a the game, if you fail, you go, well, I made the right decision. I've trained really hard. I've done the right things. It just wasn't my day. Um, that's the theory. <laughs> putting putting into practice isn't always doesn't always work, but um, yeah, that's the theory of it. Anyway. Cricket's one of those bizarre sports, isn't it? That it's it's a team sport, but it's also so individual as well. And you mentioned there sort of the, the pressure on yourself, sort of yeah. How do you how does that sort of work in your head, and how do you sort of get used to that? That actually sort of like an individual performance can have such an impact on the whole team. 
yeah definitely yeah it's it is a bit of a weird sport in that sense it is quite individual um I think just really taking it back to basics um again it sounds a bit cliche but just remembering why you're there and and you know you can't have 11 players every single game being player of the match that's never going to happen so just going well if I can contribute or if I can win a game one in every five or one in every six that's my job um and yeah just just really bring it back to basics and just try not to think about the big picture just while you're there just think I'm just going to enjoy this and and do my thing um and then hopefully that you know everything else will take care of itself we've spoken there about sort of yeah the individual nature of cricket and the more likely to fail than not but obviously there are amazing moments what are some of the highlights that you've experienced as a as a player what are the the, the really good moments that stand out to you um pro oh, that's a good question probably uh taking my first wicket in 100 um it was at lords which is obviously like it's the best ground in the world the most special ground in the world um yeah, I think it, it took me a few games, actually. Um, I was kind of in there as like a holding bowler, so I wasn't really I wasn't really there to take wickets, I guess. Um, but I, I think I played the first four games and didn't take a wicket. And then finally took my first wicket a lot, and that was, yeah, really special. Um, I think just, I'm not really someone, like I'm not, I'm not really not a stats person at all. <laughs> um uh, so like taking the most wickets or scoring the most wins isn't something I'm overly bothered about but I think um, yeah the, the first few games at Storm when I first joined Western Storm when we first turned pro um, and my first few games as a professional cricketer was probably the most proud I've been because um, you walk out there and you're going right this, this is it now like this is yeah this is what, this is what we're here for um, I can't even remember how we did or how I played it or anything but just yeah the first few games have been pro it was, it was pretty special. Make sure you follow Sportspiel on social media. Search for Sportspiel Pod on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or on LinkedIn. going to switch uh, topic slightly a little bit now but something else I'm very interested to, to to get into is just over a year ago you did quite a powerful interview that, that made quite a lot of headlines and opened up and, and shared your story so I was just wondering if for those who may be listening to the podcast hadn't heard the story weren't aware of it if you could just in your own words sort of describe yeah, what you shared in that in that story and, and why you chose to to open up and, and be so incredibly honest, which is you know, so much respect for you for doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I uh well I was probably I can't remember how old it was now, about twenty. So going into my last year of university, I went through uh, quite a major trauma. Um and my mental health just really declined from there. It's probably something I struggled with anyway. I'm just gonna move out the sun because it's over in front of um yeah, well, it was raining that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um something that I've I've struggled with anyway for, for a number of years, but um just one incident one night of my life like really escalated everything and, and I've re really struggled with my mental health for quite a number of years. Um went really up and down. Um I decided to quit cricket because I just I remember being on the pitch at one point and going I I can't even look after myself. I can, I can barely get out of bed and I'm here playing cricket. And I felt really, um, like really guilty and really embarrassed that I was taking the place of someone else on the pitch that would really want to be there. And I really didn't want to be there. Um, I remember that exact moment where I just went, I can't, I can't. I looked at the girl on the sideline that wasn't playing because I was and I went, I cannot take her place. <laughs> she deserves to be here a lot more than I do. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm about five percent here. Um, so yeah, I had a couple of years out from cricket. Um, like really, I guess went off the rails a bit. Like really, just had no self respect for myself. Um, didn't want a job. Didn't want to try anything. Didn't want to have a career. Yeah, was barely turning up to work. 
um, was where I getting out of bed. At one point, I didn't have anywhere to live. I was living on a friend's sofa, so I just didn't didn't really know what I was doing. Um, and then, yeah, really luckily, I got back in touch with uh, Nick Denning, who I used to work with. He was one of my coaches, and uh, when I was a bit younger, and just said, "Look, Nick, I really need to." sort myself out and I, I really think that getting back into cricket would help me with that it would give, give me a focus and give me something to work, work towards and something outside of partying and drinking um and he just said yeah absolutely and he, he sorted me out straight away with, with playing um, back down in Hampshire um and I'd love to say that that was where I went, ah, oh, right, I'm fine now. I've got cricket back in my life. I don't need to worry about myself anymore. But unfortunately, that wasn't quite the case. And I still still really, really struggled with it. Um, and then when when I turned pro, I went, right, I'm, I actually really, really need to sort this out now. Like, I'm not just working anymore. I'm playing in front of hundreds of people and with a team around me. And my mental health now is not just affecting me, it's actually affecting other people and affecting my team and going into work, into training, etc. Um, and so, yeah, I started talking to someone. I got a lot of help through the PCA or the Professional Cricketers Trust. Um, and they sent me up with a therapist and here we are. We're doing, <laughs> doing better. I'm, still, I'm not 100% by any stretch of the imagination. I have some days are really good, some days are really bad, but um, much more myself. I'm much more honest about how I'm feeling and much more open about it. And that's what we've been working on and that's where I am now. The honesty you mentioned there, so I know from my personal experience, that's something I struggle with being, is, is honest with myself about what's really going on. And when you were having those difficult times, when you had those couple of years out of cricket, were you aware of the fact that you know thinking this isn't right or were you being honest with yourself or were you sort of even hiding things from from yourself as well yeah I had no absolutely no self-awareness whatsoever I think I probably knew deep down that there was something not quite right but um yeah I've had no self-awareness whatsoever I can't I, there's actually a really long time that I don't really remember a lot of things that happened because I was just kind of floating I was in my own little world or not even in my world it's in the crazy world I don't, I don't know what was going on but um yeah really didn't have that self-awareness really couldn't be open about it felt just really really embarrassed that um the yeah, my life had been almost turned upside down by just one one single event and um it's not I don't talk about it all the time now it's not something I walk down the street going uh oh, I yeah <laughs> um, look at me but I can walk into trainer now and say to one of the girls oh, I feel a bit rough today like I'm Feel really anxious today. I've got really anxious belly, and two probably two out of the eleven girls are going, "Oh yeah, me too." Um, and it kind of just makes you feel a bit more normal and a bit more human, and going, "Ah, oh, all right." That's. I wish none of us felt anxious, but actually, it's quite nice that three of us are in it together. Um, but yeah, I think at the time it wasn't. You know, I, I wasn't just thinking, "Oh, I'm a bit anxious." It was. It was probably a lot more than that, but yeah, but I didn't definitely didn't have that self awareness, and there was no honesty around it whatsoever with no one but I never ever spoke to anyone about it and um, that's the way it was interesting you you recall a moment there on the on the cricket pitch where it all sort of hit you um and it's very similar to something Kate Cross mentioned as well so she's one of our previous guests that she was feeling down I think it was at fine leg and sort of burst into tears is it was that almost yeah was that a realization that something needed to change or yeah sort of what when that moment happened to you what were your sort of immediate reflections afterwards yeah I think um yeah I had a panic, panic attack during one of the Super League games and I think I was still just massively in denial I think I just thought oh it's just because I'm nervous or it's just because of cricket or yeah I, I just can't, I, it's actually crazy to think right now and think how in denial about it all I was. I just could, I couldn't admit to myself that there was anything wrong. Because um, I didn't want there to be anything. I think that was the thing I really, I wanted to be 100% all the time. And I really put a lot of pressure on being 100% all the time. So I didn't, I didn't want there to be anything slightly different about the way my brain works or something that I needed to talk to someone about. It just seemed all a bit too big and a bit too scary. Um but yeah, l luckily I had the physio in 
um, at Swiggum Vipers, where I was playing at the time, was absolutely amazing. And she she basically forced me to go and speak to someone. Um, so I, I would definitely owe a lot to her. Um, but yeah, I think that's the key, isn't it? Like, you, it sounds really cliche, but surround yourself with good people and good things will happen. Like, um, I wouldn't be like here, probably wouldn't be here today if I hadn't had amazing people around me. So that that's definitely the key. People that want to see you shine, I guess, and see what want to see you get better. And um, those are people you want to be around. Um, and it might be sometimes might be difficult conversations, but they're the right ones to have and the good ones to have. When you go to see a therapist and speak to someone for the first time, how did you find that opening up or or did you not open up? Was it quite a difficult process for you? Yeah, I think probably the thing that I struggled most with, definitely opening up, like it took me months to to actually be my authentic self. I was still trying to make her laugh and try and be happy all the time and she was there going I can I know yeah like, <laughs> I've done this job for a long time I know when someone's taking it um but yeah I think uh, actually probably a, a really big thing for me was I always blamed my mental health struggles with with this trauma and I put everything on that and I said well if that hadn't happened I would be fine and actually finally admitting that I probably would have struggled anyway and that's just the way that I am and that my mental health is quite up and down um that was a big thing for me, like actually realising, not just blaming one event, the, the knock-on effect of the next six years, although that probably had a big effect, but not just blaming everything on that and going, right, this is the way that I am and that's fine. I just You just got to work with it, work with what you've got. Yeah, something I can definitely resonate with there, like the blaming of one event and something you mentioned earlier as well, like the embarrassment as well, is something mm -hmm. I can definitely relate to, but you then chose to to come out and do that interview um, just over a year ago. What made you want to sort of put that in the public domain and, and how did it make you feel actually doing that and then the, the response you got to it as well? Yeah. Um, I think it, it was... I was really on an iron whether I was going to do it because I'm quite a... Or I've always been quite like five, not massively private, but quite quite reserved and not again, not really someone that ever wanted to talk about stuff. And I didn't want it to turn into like, oh, look at me, like look what I've been through for me. Um, but then I actually thought I sat down and I thought, well, when I saw Crossy's interview, when she Kate Cross's interview, when she spoke about it, did I think that about her? And I was like, no, of course I didn't. I just thought, wow, that's amazing. I'm I'm like really grateful that she's done that because that makes me feel better and. As soon as I started thinking of it in that way, I thought, oh, actually, the 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 PCA and the Cricketers Trust have done so much for me. Like, they've honestly been amazing. Um, this is a great opportunity for me to say thank you and to encourage other people to go and speak to them as well because because of how much they've helped me. Um, and I just thought, if I can if I can do that, it's nice to get off my nose. I don't mind opening up and talking about my struggles. It's it's. I, you know, I'm quite happy to do that now. So I've actually, you know, I can do that. And if one person listens and goes, ah, oh, I'll go speak to someone, then yeah, that's, that's why I did it really. And sort of, yeah, seeing all that positive response, or maybe you've heard stories, but other people have felt inspired to come out and seek help or feel like they can resonate with your journey. How does that make you feel? Does that make you feel like it was worthwhile to, to open up and speak out about it? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, definitely. I think that I didn't expect it to get that big of a response, and that many people to see it, and that many people to send me a message. And I just thought a couple of people would see it, and then I'd never hear of it again. And it was it was pretty overwhelming. And um, yeah, it, it was. You know, it made me feel a bit better as well, which is quite nice. I know there's a lot of people supporting you, but um, yeah, it was one hundred. I'm so glad I did it. I'm so glad I spoke about it. Um, it wasn't the easiest interview ever, but of course it wasn't. I never have, but you know, if I can speak, it, I feel really lucky now that I'm in a position now that I can speak about it. So I want to use that as much as I can. And I guess for your, what would be a a key message for for people maybe listening to this, who maybe think they are struggling a little bit or know that they can recognise that someone's struggling. Would you have like a key, a key message that you've noticed or something that you would you would say to them as advice? Um, 
yeah, just just remember that you're not the only person going through that. Um, like I said, I think a, a big turning point for me is being able to to go into training and there's say 15 of us sat around and I go, girls, I'm feeling rubbish today. I've got anxious belly. I didn't want to get out of bed. And a couple of other people say the same thing. Um, so yeah, it, there's a lot of people are in the same boat as you. Yeah. Um, and actually, you know, like I said before, surrounding yourself with, with good people that want to help you get better and be there for you. Um, and speaking to them about it, being vulnerable. Um, that are the most important things you can do. Um, yeah, that's it's really simple advice, but just, just speak up. Uh, it's, it's really difficult sometimes. The first time you speak up will be horrendous and you'll feel awful, but it gets it gets a lot easier. It'll become more of a second nature. Um, it's the only way you're going to get better. You mentioned in a, in a previous answer the importance of the Professional Cricketers Association, the Professional Cricketers Trust. How, yeah, I guess sort of how impactful are they and have they been on, on you and, and, and other cricketers and how important is their is their role? Yeah, it's um it's absolutely massive. I, I honestly can't I can't actually think about how I would be now without the trust. Um you know we, we really don't use them enough as cricketers. Like we've got this amazing um amazing setup that are literally there to to help us with our lives and we we definitely don't use them enough. Um I do now absolutely rinse them for everything it's great <laughs> um, but yeah they're, they're they're absolutely amazing the people that work for them um and you know for the, for the PCA as well we get a um like a mentor with each team um, and they're all absolutely amazing people and great to speak to um great to help them with your life um so yeah honestly I've I've thanked them a thousand times so I still I will carry on doing that but yeah they're absolutely brilliant and they've the PCA have given you a little bit of recognition as well because you're up for the PCA business impact awards which I think the it's coming out tomorrow as we record the the results of that <laughs> I was <Right>. yeah <laughs> yes yeah, so I had that um yeah good little business plug for me actually here this is great yeah so I started um a business called the throwing academy which is basically combining my two my two um passions of injury rehab helping people feel like not feel pain-free basically so helping them with their injury rehab and then cricket um so I help people throw better so they don't get injured to help them rehabilitate their throwing injuries etc etc go into schools and do like really fun throwing and catching classes with them um and yeah I went into to it's basically that dragon's den last week so I went in and um, plugged my business and they seem to really like it and I've got a website for it and everything now so um yeah fingers crossed we'll find out tomorrow <laughs> I actually already know but what yeah um, yeah we'll find out tomorrow so yeah it was just it was a brilliant day really like it was just it just summed up how amazing the PCA were like the amount they were just they're willing to help um, and it just yeah it was just like really summed up how, how great they are and how much they can help you if you, if you use them and how are you finding it running your own business and doing all these things alongside being a professional cricketer um yeah, good. So it's it's been like the last couple of months is like really where I've had the idea and started pushing it. So it's only at, like really at the beginning, but um, I'm I find it really hard sitting still. So in the winter when we when we're already training three days a week, and I'm going, well, what am I going to do with the other four? <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's been it's been a really good focus for me, and actually, it's probably one of the really big reasons why my mental health is is really good at the moment is because I've got that that focus and. I'm a, I'm a really creative person and having that creative side of our business, the creative side of it, that I'm like fulfilling that side of me as well has been, has been really great. Um, but yeah, I'm sure in the summer it'll probably be a bit more difficult, but at the moment I'm just, I'm really enjoying juggling the two. Mm -hmm. um, and Thunder have been brilliant with helping me with that as well. And yeah, we've got, so, you know, in, I feel really lucky that I've got a lot of, places and people that can help me in a lot of um a lot of support so I just want to use that as much as possible um, and alongside that as well uh you've also joined our friends and partners at the Mintridge Foundation as an ambassador how are you finding that so far yeah I love it Alex is amazing <laughs> she certainly is yeah yeah she's so great um yeah I love it like I, I've um 
I've basically the reason why I wanted to join, and actually it was completely random because I wanted to start doing something like that about two days before I got a message from Alex. I was literally, it was just coming into my head, like I really want to start going into doing a bit more mentoring. Um, and then I got a message from Alex, so it was perfect timing. But yeah, I think from just thinking back from when I was younger and when I was at school and then a bit after, I didn't really have that um, that kind of mentor person there or um, someone that was really helping me with my life outside of cricket. It seemed like it was, well, I had my teachers at school that were helping me with that. And then I had people at cricket that helped me with cricket, but I didn't have anyone that was like, helping me combine them together. And I think because of that, I went, oh, I don't want really to play cricket anymore then. I'm just going to sack this off. I'm going to do whatever I want. And I think if I'd had someone there to really mentor me through that, it would have been a lot easier. Um, so I thought, well, I'd love to go into schools and, and basically do that. And that the Mint Church is, yes, yeah, it's perfect. And it's such a great place to to work. And there's amazing people around. And it's just, yeah, it's a, it's a brilliant, brilliant charity. I absolutely love what they're doing. And how does that make you feel when you go in and you are being a mentor or you're leading a session and you can see other people enjoying the game you love so much and learning? How does that make you feel? Yeah, it's, um, it sounds so cliche and so cheesy, but it's, it's, it's what we're here for. Like, um, uh, I remember, you know, I think there's a certain, a certain part of you that has to, to be a professional athlete, you have to be a little bit selfish and um, when you go into work every day and pretty much everything that you're doing is to make yourself better um, and it's kind of for yourself and I, I probably struggled a little bit with that at the beginning because I, I'm someone that really likes helping other people and giving back and and yeah mentoring is a perfect way to do that um, and yeah like you said just seeing seeing young kids and, and school children playing the sport that you love and loving it too it's like oh it gives you that little burst doesn't it like oh that's that's my passion and I'm passing on to someone else um yeah it gives you that buzz that I don't get as much playing I get more of a buzz from, from watching other people and you know it's a different it's a different kind I guess but um yeah it's been it's been great it's been great for my mental health as well again um so yeah it's been a lot more than it so many exciting things going on for you at the moment and Let's just get to wrap it up by just saying sort of new club in 2023, you've got your business, you're working with Mintridge. How excited are you for for what the next 12 months has to to offer? Yeah, I'm really, yeah, really, really excited. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm loving, I'm, obviously, like I said, I moved up to Manchester. I'm loving it here. Started a business, got, got myself in Mintridge. It's going to be busy. Um, but yeah, like this, the last this year have kind of sort of been the year of growth and next year I want to just carry on growing and um yeah like I said my, my mental health is in a really good place at the moment and I'm hoping that can that can carry on going forward but yeah I, I feel like I've got loads of exciting stuff coming on um coming up which is really great and we'll just see see how we go with them not put too much pressure on them which I keep <laughs> keep reminding myself of that's the key um but yeah just try and enjoy it just try and enjoy every minute of it I also read somewhere that you have an advanced scuba diving qualification. <laughs> Will you be putting that to use in 2023, do you think? Hopefully. I did actually in um, about six weeks ago. We went to Egypt. Yes, my, my, one of my sisters is a scuba diving instructor in Thailand, of course, because, you know, why not? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, when you've got six brothers and sisters, one of them's going to have a great crazy job. But yeah, so I did, I did my, um, my advanced scuba diving with her. But yeah, hopefully I'd love to. I think when we're hoping to go out to Thailand again maybe after the season and do a little bit um so yeah that'll be a bit of fun amongst all the craziness <laughs> certainly exciting year for you coming up I can't wait personally to see how you progress both with the cricket and also with Mintridge and stuff um thank you for speaking with us today and for such a a fun honest interview and I really hope the people listening in, enjoyed it and yeah, all the best going forward. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Nice to meet you, Will. Once again, a massive thank you to Fee for such an honest and open interview that covered a wide range of topics and delved into many important issues. We cannot wait to see how she fares this season and will certainly be cheering her on all the way. 
We would also like to congratulate Fee as she was named the winner of the PCA Business Awards that we mentioned in the podcast. So congratulations to her and massively excited to see where her, her business goes from here. Thank you also to the Minteridge Foundation for helping to organise the interview and for continuing their brilliant work with young aspiring athletes and we continue to be proud to be partners with them. I'll be back next Tuesday with two guests who also happen to be friends and teammates of mine as we discuss all things cheerleading and answer the question, how do you set up a brand new cheer squad during a global pandemic and make it a success? In the meantime, make sure to subscribe to Sports Bill on all of your usual podcast providers and follow us across social media by searching for the handle at Sports Bill Pod.